Welcome everybody. Thursday, the May 20th edition of Thursday Training. We are still covering nine things you simply must do to succeed in love and life. We are on, uh, we covered the seventh, or excuse me, the fifth principle, seventh chapter last uh, week. And last week somebody made a, um, or excuse me, am I wrong? No, it was, excuse me, it's the sixth chapter. Sixth chapter. Fourth yeah. principle. And someone made a suggestion last week that we kind of go over that chapter again. I'm prepared to cover the next chapter, which is seven. The, the seven and uh, principle five, mm -hmm. which is act like an ant. So I'll leave it up to you guys. What do you think? Um, was there an expectation to come here and kind of share? Because again, I know I say it, it's not, um, you know, it's not stage talk. More you and less of me is good. It's, it's a good thing um, for those who watch and hopefully are influenced. So the last one was do something. Do it. You got to do something. Do you want to cover that? You want to kind of move forward, um, and I'll take a few sips, and hopefully somebody will respond. Poor Tammy Wilson Rice is having a tough time getting in though. The Andre, I'm gonna tell you that right now. She might have just made it. Yes, she just Matthew. Made. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me either way. But I'll be honest. This is the first week I haven't read my chapter. So if we discuss okay. chapter seven, I'll just listen and not participate because I didn't get to read it. Okay. It's been a, a weird week for me. Yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, well, I don't want to review it, like just kind of regurgitate what I did last week. So I'll leave the floor open if somebody wants to jump in and comment on on the uh, do something um, chapter. Then we'll do that. The thing I liked about the previous chapter is a lot of practical stuff. There's a lot of practical stuff. There's some really neat practical stuff um, in the chapter in the next chapter. So if we don't get a whole lot of feedback or any feedback at all, we'll go ahead and move on. We got. We got Dana saying that's fine, right? And Vivian as well. Vivian saying it's fine. And Vault, she's saying she hasn't read chapter seven yet. Okay. And by the way, um, you made co-host Sarah. Is that oh. Yes. <laughs> I didn't mean Sarah to. Smiling. Yes. I didn't mean to saddle you with extra duties there, Sarah. My bad. There you are, Leandro. You know why? It's because it moves when somebody comes in. Yes. Okay. All right. We're kind of ready to go. We are. All right. So I can look over kind of the, the last one and, and pick out some things. Um, but again, I, I feel like this was kind of Vatris's call. If she's not here with us, I know that she would have um, a lot to add to it. I mean, some of the things that I think about that, that he talks about is, and I'm just kind of reading my notes in the corner is what can I control? Yeah. So let's kind of review real quick first. And he does so in the beginning of the next chapter, uh, which is, so my deja vu friends have taught me that, that life comes from within. Do not hang on to the negative stuff. They think about how actions affect the future, right? Playing the movie. Mm -hmm. And then they ask how they can make things better. Do something. Mm -hmm. But what can I do to make it better? Mm -hmm. So remember, it, it all starts there. It, it, and we're going to, I'm going to get into this next chapter today because I don't see a whole lot of people responding. And I don't want to just kind of regurgitate what I did last week. We have it on tape. Um, but there's some really cool things in this chapter where it talks about, um, everything. And if you remember when we covered Leandro with all those, those students sitting in that big auditorium and it, he said it was beautifully crafted. He did a very good job of kind of painting a picture, a verbal picture of what that looked like. And he reminded everybody that that started in somebody's mind and everything does. So this next chapter is a lot about identifying what we can control, what, uh, metrics or what are we looking at to motivate us right and so when we don't hang on to the negative we convince ourselves we're going to do something we have to have those things first right we can't just jump in and go okay act like an ant you know one grain of sand at a time that's easy we'll do that it doesn't work like that and he talks about that because in this chapter there's a lady it's you know so fitting because we all deal with it who's dealing with weight loss and he actually starts the chapter talking about a dissertation. Did you know that doctoral, like doctoral students, that there was a classification called ABD? All but dissertation. Like they went through their schooling. I didn't know this. They went through their schooling, their graduate school, but they never wrote their dissertation, which is basically like a book, right? It's a publication. It's literally published. Um, and I didn't know that. And it says here, yeah, ABD. Hold on. 
It says right here, in fact, quite a large number of people go through three or four years of graduate school, complete all their coursework, Leandro, and end up being an ABD, all but dissertation. They never get their doctoral degrees. And so he talks about it. And to me, I really relate because, you know, the, the idea of writing a dissertation in graduate school. So you have to write it like where you're in. Some of them wait, but most of them write it while they're in. So when they're done with their coursework, they're kind of finishing up their dissertation. Um, but I didn't know that a lot of people didn't do it. And the reason is, and he talks about it, is because we get overwhelmed by a big task, right? And so that's kind of his first thing. He said, it's a pretty good metaphor for many people's dreams in life. Since they're, so the, the idea is the dissertation is done without guidance or, or any manager or someone telling them what to do. And I listen, there are people like that, like military people. The, you know what they want? They don't care about your, your opinions. They want the procedure. Give me the procedure. To tell me what I'm supposed to do. And you've got people in the world that are extremely good at that. You give them a procedure and they are thorough, efficient, tight. Um, I've never run an organization like that. Like, I'm not saying procedures are bad. I, I, don't, I don't mean that at all. But when we're building something as an entrepreneur, and I think even some of my staff will, would amen this, I even draw the analogy. I'm like, this isn't the military. We don't really have a procedure because we're always doing new things. Now, once we do them, I am a huge system and process guy. So we absolutely do create those. But we need minds and people to think and move and do without someone standing over them, giving the procedure and holding them accountable. And I'll tell you what the opposite of this behavior is right now is my son, James, who is a fantastic kid. Do not get me wrong. He doesn't get in trouble. He doesn't, you know, he's not a mean person. He's, he's a really cool guy, but he's a 14 year old going on 15 year old boy. And it's like, I'm not a coerce and compel leader, right? Which he needs right now, which I am, I guess. Hey, pick, I mean, literally he leaves the refrigerator door open. <laughs> it's, it's like, you do something like, you know, I, I haven't gotten to pick up all your crap. Close the, the door. It's like Bill Cosby did a thing years ago called a uh, 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 stand up called. And, you know, I know he's a polarizing figure, but this was he did this back in the late 70s called Bill Cosby himself. And he does. If you haven't seen that, I would run not walk. It's one of the best stand ups ever done by any comedian in the world. And he talks about how he has to tell his son. He said, OK, now I want you to go up. I want you to take all your clothes off in the bathroom. I want you to turn the water on. I want you to wash with soap. I need you to dry. He said, because something like one time his kid came out and he's got his pajamas on, but they're all stuck to him because he didn't dry himself first. And he's like, he's got to tell him everything. And I feel like that with James right now, yeah. which is really the opposite of a deja vu person. So the beginning of this act like an ant chapter is about, it's, if, if you've ever heard of the, um, uh, there's a book called How to Eat That Elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Right. Hey, now you don't have to buy the book. Mm -hmm. There's a Cliff Notes version right there. How do you need an elephant? One bite at a time. So this is about breaking big tasks into small jobs, into small goals. And we've talked about that, creating small goals and hitting those and then celebrating them. Right. And they can be little goals. Like he talks in here about John Grisham was an attorney. Right. We everything. Everybody knows that all his books are about law and want to write a book. But he's like, how the hell am I going to write a book? And he wrote his first book, A Time to Kill, one page a day. He got up early in the morning, 30 minutes earlier than he normally did. And he wrote one page each day. And then came A Time to Kill, which was a fantastic book. Great movie. Matthew McConaughey. Uh, he's, he's, pretty, he's a pretty good looking dude. I like watching him on the screen in a, in a healthy way. Don't get me wrong. But man, he's, he's awesome. And then he wrote The Firm. I couldn't put The Firm down. The Firm, that was with uh, Tom, Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah, but the book, when I picked that book up and read it, I literally made my husband stop at a Walmart in the middle of the night and we were driving from Texas to Nashville so that I could keep reading it. Really? So I could get a little pen light and keep reading it. <laughs> and, and the movie was a lot different. Like, yeah. he never told his wife in the movie, you know, I mean, in the book. Exactly. Right? There's so many big differences, but you're right. John's a good writer. Yeah, he is. Um, so anyway, I love that, that sentence. It's why a lot of people's dreams get put on hold. And the someday I will is like the dream killer. And, and it's almost like that's probably why, in fact, that's one of the main reasons why New Year's resolutions don't work. It's not that it's New Year's Day that's so bad. It's, it's if someone waits till New Year's to do it, they're not really committed. And I don't mean that to be cynical. It's just like, you know, if you knew there was a better way to do things, when would you want to do it right now? So putting it off promotes that comfort. I've been there, haven't you? Like you're going to start on day, you're like, you know what? 
I'm gonna start on Monday. I asked somebody the other day, I was like, how often do you diet? And she said, I start a new one every Monday, <laughs> right? Because on Friday, you're like, man, I'm going to do it on Monday. And it gives you a free pass. All of a sudden, the stress of being disciplined is off of you. It's so normal. Um, he does quote uh, a book in a book. And I got to tell you, in Proverbs, that's an Old Testament thing. So that's a pre-Jesus thing. But I would tell you this, you know, spiritual or not, or, you know, religious or not, I'm not very religious and very spiritual. But Proverbs is just, a, if you just, as an agnostic, or even as an atheist, read Proverbs, you'd be like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just success principles. You know, it, it, it's really not all that religious. It's more, and this is, go to the ant, you slugger. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler. And it's a great analogy because if you watch ants, they're working. They're working. They're working. They don't have, they all have a job but they don't have anybody, co you know, coercing and compelling them, you know, saying, James, you know, you got to dry yourself off and then, you know, leave the towel hanging and then put on underwear tonight. You know, you got to tell them everything, but deja vu people, you don't. And listen, there's, we're going to talk a little bit about this, about, um, oh, let me finish that. Man, I, my, I'm telling you, my ADD is out of control today. Um, it has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and it gathers its food at harvest. Hmm. So he does or she does what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. And I think a lot of times it's really easy. Well, I didn't really have great leadership. I mean, great leadership is beautiful and everybody needs a you know, good leader, but that shouldn't be, again, I think it's more of this idea of changing our, our excuses to our reasons, right? If, if we can switch that, like, you know, it's like the two brothers, right? Both are successful. One asked one of them, why, you, why did you, or one was successful, one, one was, ended up in prison. They go to the guy in prison and said, why did you end up there? And he said, well, I came from a broken home. My parents were drug addicts. I was abused as a child. I didn't have access to good education. And then they go to the guy who's very, very successful and said, why were you successful? And he goes, I came from a broken home. My parents were drug addicts. I was abused. I didn't have access to good education. I had to get the hell out. Mm -hmm. Change the excuses to reasons. And I was talking to my mom today and I didn't even know that I was talking to her about, you know, it was like I was in it and I was like, wow, this is highly appropriate for my mother. She had had a rough time. And I told her, I said, the minute we become a victim, and we've talked about this, right? The minute we become a victim of circumstance, and that circumstance could be, you know, a person, it could be a job, it could be, you know, the unfairness of anything. Once we become a victim, all the problem solving centers in our brain shut down. And now we go into survival mode, we go into defense mode, we're no longer from a, a, a neurological, biological standpoint, we're no longer in a hunting and gathering phase. We're more in a, in a recess phase from a, a, a synaptic function. So the idea of fair is a made up delusional construct only applicable and only known by the eye, from the eye of the beholder. My definition of fair, his definition of fair, your definition of fair is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And so there is no fairness. It doesn't work that way. There, if there's no arbiter up in the sky going, yep, that was unfair. One point to you. Nobody cares, right? So as we begin to tie this idea of, okay, we're in charge of what we think. We're in charge of removing the negative thoughts, the negative people. Remember, we talked about that. It's complex. A lot of things in there with respect to boundaries and you know, family. And, and there, I know there's a lot going on there, but it doesn't remove the truth that negative people are going to drain us. And yes, you might say, well, I'm the light to the negative person. Yes, yes, we can be, but it's also very draining. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you rather spend that energy mm -hmm. on casting seeds to deep soil, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to shallow. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm going to take a break here. Yeah. Errors, comments, additions, cares, concerns, questions. Um, some people that are listening to Audible. Audible is great. And I, I'm, I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. So it's good. For Audible's them. fine, guys. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as we have processing, that's all that matters. Um, it's easier when we have guidance. It's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And when you're an entrepreneur, when you're chasing your dream, yes, we should be seeking guidance, counsel. We should have mentors and people that, that we can call our accountable, accountable brothers and sisters, accountable life partners. But we really have to go on God. 
a lot of times and i'm just thinking of me in this business and you know even if even if this was a 20 year old industry how many people in the industry that are successful are going to call me in and say hey here's what we do to be successful good luck competing with us you know it's just there's a lot of things that we have to do within ourselves and it goes back to and i know i'm all over the place a little bit i will turn it around and, and put a button in it but it goes back to that self-worth and it goes back to what what comments do we allow to impact us and he talks in here that a lot of times we don't remember like i heard a guy say that the, the compliments that are given to us and the in the wins that we get in life um kind of hit us and we're like teflon like we feel it for a minute and then it goes then we automatically are thinking more where we have to go where we haven't gone what we can't do what we all that stuff and i think that that's normal human behavior because the negative seems to stick to us like velcro right so we're it's all about taking responsibility and having some ownership over our activities. So I heard a pod, or not a podcast. I was, I was, I went out to see my mother today. She's about 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. So I'm a radio time today. So I'm listening to one of my favorite guys and I can only take a little bit of him, but I love his interviews. He's one of the better interviewers ever, uh, Jim Rohn. And he's interviewing a basketball player on the Dallas Mavericks who went to University of Florida. And his name is uh, Darian Finley Smith. And Darian wasn't drafted and he had to go to a summer league and he was found. And now he's one of the probably top 10, 15 guys in the NBA. So he's conceivably a top 10, 15 draft draft, like not 15 round, but top 15 pick. And he wasn't drafted. And instead of using that as an excuse to go to Europe or, you know, kind of abandon that dream, he kind of kept with it. And Jim asked him, the conversation got to where Finley Smith completely, after being one of the top scorers in the league, completely changed his shot. He reworked the mechanics of his shot. Not like, oh, I'll go higher. The, all the mechanics changed with a, with a shooting coach. And Jim says, well, how was that? And he says, well, it was really hard because you really expect a certain result and, you're, and you don't get it. And he said, you're not going to get, the, Finley, said, Finley Smith said, you're never going to get the results that you want right away when you make a change there is a law he said there is a and then jim rome speaks it with him and they both said process that you have to go through and he said he was shooting lights out in practice and in scrimmages but it wasn't translating to a game and jim says well how do you how do you keep going and have the faith and the buy-in and the confidence and he says when you start focusing only on results it's an endless path that goes nowhere. He said, what I was focused on is what I could do to make it better and get through that process. The reason I bring that up is because the next kind of story that he tells in here is a story of a lady, which is one of his, obviously one of his patients who wants to lose weight. And she's lost 30 pounds before and gained 30 pounds back. And so he's talking to her and where, look, hold on just a minute, bear with me, let me. Bear with me, guys. Let me read this real quick. Um, if I had examined a few significant accomplishments that I had already accomplished in my in life, I would have seen that they were done in the fashion of the ant as well but I didn't. We don't tend to see such things in our own lives. We look at what we cannot do or have not done or somehow think other people are endowed with something special, not remembering that our own successes may cause us to appear that way to others. When I was growing up, I ran with a, of a group of about 10 dudes and uh, we were athletes and we worked out. In my whole high school life, I was trying to catch up and kind of get at back then we were looking to get thick, get big, right? This is, you know, we were kids and there was Jerry and Mike and, uh, and Brent. And I just wanted to catch up to him, man. I just wanted to be built like those guys and then come to realize, and I'm still friends with all those guys. I talked to Mike yesterday, Jerry, a few days ago. I mean, I still keep in, they're still like active friends in my life. And, uh, some years ago we were, we were talking about it and we realized that they thought the same about me. They were trying to catch me. Wow. So when you start to write and then, you know, I got my 30 year reunion come up and I, I actually told my, my son this. I said there were some girls in high school that I just, man, I just had, I was like, wow. And I didn't ask them out because I thought maybe they were out of my league. 
come to find out, I still know a lot of those ladies and they're all married and you know, have kids and beautiful families and come to find out almost all of them had a crush on me. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you, man. I was like, damn, I wish I would have known that. I mean, now I wish like, dang, the point is our own perception of ourselves typically is, is notches lower than how other people see us. I just uh, had the opportunity to write a letter for James. He's at a little private Christian school and his Bible teacher, uh, Miss Jones, cool as can be. Um, wanted us to write letters to them because they're in eighth grade going into high school. Mm -hmm. And it's something they can reflect back on them. And my whole thing was find the truth in who you are. And I told him who I thought he was. You know, he's a difference maker, a world changer. And he's got purpose in life. He matters. He's loved. And, you know, went kind of through this. And then near the end, I'm like, and I need you to go to the source and find now, now you know what your father feels like, you know, thinks of you literally. And now I need you to go to your source, which is our source. Um, and go find out what your heavenly father thinks of you because we need to hear those truths and it's one of the many reasons why i say get around people who who make you feel like you hung the moon get around people who celebrate you get around people who think a lot of you and and want to serve you and and love you and and, and you love them get around those people because the world is full of people that are going to tell us lies about who we are and it might not be somebody going hey pitts you're this it's done through social media i mean i got a couple of friends I feel like they live in Disneyland. I mean, if you just looked at their social media, and I know them personally, so I know the problems that they have. But if you just look at their social media, you think, man, they got a problem in the world, right? I mean, I, I don't want this to be gross, but think about little boys and girls that watch porn. They think every person is endowed with those kinds of gifts. Mm -hmm. Think about just general media. I mean, you don't see a ton of overweight people, you know, broadcasting the news, like fashion industry, fashion industry which Leandro tells me is just, a pit of vipers, yes. just horrible on body image shaming and, and so forth. So my whole point is there's 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 enough out there that we see and we're confronted with every day. And we talked last week about continue to do the same thing, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. I'm listen, I I'm I'm with you guys, right? I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't feel like Socrates and all the kids are sitting at my feet at all. We're all eye level because I'm dealing with crap right now, too. Right. But one of the things that I like tools that I use, I don't get on Twitter anymore. I do not watch. Now I've listened. It doesn't mean I'm not well abreast of the goings on in our, in our, my local community in the nation, but I don't watch news. I don't watch talking heads. I don't do that. And that's just for me. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, guys. This isn't a political talk. It just happens to be that those are some of the tools that I use because like we talked about a couple of chapters ago, negative to me is like rotten milk. It just like, it's involuntary. I don't, hold on to and go, well, maybe this negative will taste better later. It just, it just, ah, mm -hmm. so anyway, people that achieve their goals do so one small step at a time. The reason people don't lose or lose weight and then gain it back. It says right here, first, your life didn't change. Only your weight did. You lost the weight, but at the time you were not growing inwardly. And you did not add to your life the kinds of habits, structures, support, and the like that go on that, that goes with successful weight loss. Bear with me here. He recommends, he said, but if you focus on changing your habits and allow the weight loss to be slow, a slow result of a truly changed life. See, he's not focusing on the sale. He's not focusing on the ball. He's focusing on approach, right? Then, so, but, but if you focus on changing your habits, allow the weight loss to be a slow result of a truly changed life, then it is going to remain off. A small amount of exercise every day, small cutbacks in calories or points or whatever you're counting, and a small amount of oversight and accountability, which translates to a pound a week coming from very small steps. And here's what she says. A pound a week? Are you joking? That is so depressing. It would take me six or seven months to lose what I need to lose. I can't wait that long to look better. I want to lose it now. I'm ready now. When I was coaching James, we pulled up to Pinellas Park Little League one Saturday morning, get ready for games, right? We're unloading the truck. I got balls. I got, you know, backstops. I'm, I'm carrying everything. And this little, and I, you know, I'm not politically correct. Like this is as good as it gets for me. And so sometimes this little kid, and his mom are walking away and he's having kind of a tantrum. And so he, all I hear is, I want my donut. 
I mean, loud, like it was a screech, like this kid was falling off a cliff, right? And I looked at James, and so that's our thing now. Yeah. I mean, that's how I get him. Sometimes when he gets a little bit, you know, boyish, like a, boy, a, a teen, young teenage boy does, I go, you kind of sound like Donut Boy. That's what this lady, that's what I thought about when I saw the, I need it, I'm ready now. Like, eh. Why? whiny right it's like a child and that's why i bring it up i get like a child sometimes well yeah i'll give you an example when my dad passed i didn't think it was that big a deal i mean it was a big deal but i grieved and then like one day i woke up and i'm just all i can think about are the times that i had with them and that grieving went to a joy and you know because of my faith it's like and then it kind of one day I, I i was like i'll call my dad and i pulled my phone out and i was like oh and then it hits me one of the things that I realized that my dad did for me um, was he is or was the ultra sensitivity for me. So if I like, I don't complain much. I, I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to be Billy badass, but I really don't like to complain because I don't like when people complain to me. Not that I don't want to hear it, but I don't know what to do with it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'm like, I don't want to put people in uncomfortable. So I don't complain much. And I've got a relatively high pain tolerance. But when things happen that are major, I am kind of like a little, I need to be, I need to be nurtured. Right, Leandro? I don't need like a pad on the back. I'm not talking about physically, but a, a, a real deep level of concern. And, um, and that was my dad. He was the guy that would ask me about the inner stuff, right? Because he knew about it. And then when he passed, I realized that there was some friction between Stacy and I because that, there was then a void, right, Leandro? And I think my natural inclination, because I've been with Stacy, we're celebrating our 23rd year, I think, um, this on the 22nd in a couple of days. But I dated her for five, so I've been with her for like 28 years. Almost 30. Right. I know. Thank you, Leandro. Almost 30. <laughs> you're, you're, Almost 30. You're, you're um, so, um, so I recognized that I was looking for her to fill the void. And that's not who she is. Like, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't be with her for almost 30 years, Leandro. If, but, and then I thought back about a, a thing I saw once in... It was Andy Stanley, the old guy, not the, not the young, not his son. And uh, he said, a lot of spouses or partners put their partner and or spouse in a no-win situation, meaning that they want to be 100% fulfilled by that person. He said, and I don't know what the number is, it's probably not a data number, it's more conceptual or, than anything, but he's like, I would say the most that you could ever be fulfilled by another person is probably 80%. And that's in a really wonderful relationship. He said, the challenge is the other 20% cannot be fulfilled by that person. In his analogy, because it was a scripture, uh, uh, biblically based teaching, it was like, God is the one who's going to, you know, who needs to be whom you lean on for these. It could be other things like, you know, reading and self-development, meditation, time alone, whatever those are. But out, like we can't 100% be fulfilled by a person, one person. So the question is, which is profound to me, how many people leave the 80% in search for that 20? Right? So it was that kind of paradigm that I'm, I'm leaning on uh, innately when I realized, and when I did was, I, I, for the first time in years, I, I called one of my best friends and I was like, hey, I got, a, I got a challenge that I need to share with you. And when I say the first time in years, I go with my marriage because typically we, Stacey and I work it out, it's, it's easier. Um, and as soon as I spoke it, I'm not even kidding you. I was like, Bill, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. and I go, and as I'm speaking this, I feel like Donut Boy. <laughs> and he goes, what's Donut Boy? And I told him the story. But that's what I felt like. Like, oh, and King not doing this, and I can't get this and that. <laughs> and it's like, dude, man up, right? And, and it hurts because, you, you know, a void is a void. A hole is a hole. And it's like, what do I, and, and there, are, there really are no long-term voids in a person's life. It will be filled with something. That's why capturing our thought, renewing our minds every day is so important because if we don't tend to that, that spot, that hole, that void, that spoke that's missing from the wheel, it will, there will be something there. Like, oh, I used to go play softball four nights a week for two hours. Now I don't play softball anymore. What do you do? Watch TV. See, it filled the void. Something will be filled. Now I read and I, and I work with underprivileged children. Oh, something, something filled the void, right? That's not me. I don't. I do read, but I don't serve underprivileged children. So I don't, I don't want that to be a, like a misleading plug. Yeah. Like everyone should serve Mrs. <laughs> Vivian Santos does. He's an ELCL teacher. 
Say what? She's an um, and second language teacher. Yeah. Vivian Santos. So she's the translator. Oh wow, Vivian! I've worked with a lot of translators. Um, some are good. When you got a when you got a good one, there's nothing like it. When you got one that's not so good, there's nothing like it. <laughs> uh, and I know it's hard. I know it's very hard. It's, well, so when I go to Nicaragua and I do and I speak a lot, I'm either teaching or talking at a church. And I always have. Um, right now, it's Alberto. It's my boy. Mm -hmm. I'm his boy too, so I didn't mean that to me to meaning. Uh, my buddy, my brother, and he is. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, he's. I mean, it's just amazing. Wow. Amazing, wow. and it yeah. makes it. It's so much easier because when you don't, when you have someone who's learning how to do it, and, and a lot of times I'll work with one of his students. So one of his students will translate like a, a meeting that I'm mm -hmm. hosting, and give them a chance to grow and develop. Mm -hmm. And that I feel like I'm serving that child when I'm doing See, it because it's hard. Are. It's hard enough because when you speak for two hours, three hours, that's hard. But you got to think, then you got to wait for the translator. So all of a sudden it becomes six hours, right? If it's, I don't do that, but that's just for the math. And then with Alberto, what I've learned, Vivian, and I don't know if this will help you anyway, but it, it changed our ministry together was, um, and I still meet with them once a week uh, via Zoom for a two hour call. And I would say three to four times during it, I'm speaking about a certain concept. And then I'll go, Alberto, does that need to be, because his class is an English class. Mm -hmm. So there's no translating when I'm speaking to them. Mm -hmm. But the same holds true when he is translating for me. And that is, is there, does this need further translation? And he'll say yes. And then I give him five, usually it's about three to five minutes where he talks to them in Spanish to really build out my ideas. To fill in the gaps. Yes, because it's, you know, on, on time translation, you're going to lose a lot. So he stops because I learned long ago, and I think I've told you guys this a hundred times earlier on when I was public speaking a lot. I just love to hear me talk. Like I just wanted to do more of it. Um, it wasn't like an ego, like oh look at me. It was just like the more the more I do, the better I get. Now it's I want to hear. I, I'm very concerned with what is heard, not even what I say, but what is heard. And so that thing with Alberto Vivian is what kind of blew that paradigm and i think we started doing that maybe seven years ago six seven years ago so you know that's how recent my kind of maturation with that is you know it wasn't 20 years ago i was like oh now i don't care you know i, I had some some self-worth issues to deal with for sure i still do okay a pound a week okay so i already did that well you might want it you might want it now i said but does that not make you ready so she's saying, I'm I, I want it now. And he's saying, you may want it now, but you're not ready now. Meaning he comes in later and he says, if you really want to lose weight, don't focus on the weight, focus on the activity. And his is threefold, right? It's exercising, eating less calories and accountability. So he said, deja vu people aren't really looking at the scale. It's okay to weigh yourself. Mm -hmm. And I wish Stacy were watching this today because I have told her this a thousand times. The weight and having goals, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But I would always have activity goals. Like I am going to only eat X amount of points or calories per day this week. I am going to exercise X amount of minutes per day this week. I am going to exercise this many minutes per day, which will be higher next week. When we focus on the activity, why do we focus on the activity, Miandro? Because it gives us those results. It's, the only, it's true, yes, but it's the only thing we can control. Yes. What if you're sick? What if you're retaining water? What if you're actually building? What if you have a workout, <coughs> excuse me, regimen that's, uh, that's pr pr has a proclivity to build muscle? Muscle weighs more than fat. So you build one pound of muscle, you lose, you have to, you have to lose a pound and a half fat, right? For the same mass. So it, it does, there's too many things outside of our control, honestly. I mean, I don't hate to be crude, but you know, a weight, you know, post bowel movement, Versus pre bowel movement. Well, I, I've been That's constipated true. for three That's days. True. I didn't lose any weight. That's yeah, true. you might have. <laughs> Focus on the activity. And that's what this is about. Act like an ant. Think about the, those, you know, when they have those glass things and they, they build this kind of beautiful ant city. <clears throat> that is done one grain at a time. That's done one grain at a time. I've got a beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to tell this parable. I'm not going to apologize for it. It is from a book in a book, but the message is the same, okay? The message is the same. It's a story of Jesus and his first miracle when he turns the water into wine. Mm -hmm. I'll spare you all the details. At the end, there's seven carafes. 
that are 30 to 50 gallons per. And the servants are told to go fill those jars, what they call them, but they're obviously huge, with water all the way to the top. Here's what I think people fail to recognize. 2,000 years ago, there wasn't a water spigot, right? There was typically a well, and the well was typically outside of the city, right? It, it, that's usually where we, everybody had to go outside the city. So think about these servants. They have to fill up what really is going to be about 300 to 350 gallons of water using a well that's not right there. And you have to think that these 30 to 50 gallon cisterns, how heavy they are, yeah. certainly with water in them. Have you ever carried a gallon of milk? By the time you get to your car, it's pretty heavy. You ever carried a five gallon bucket of water that's you know, sloshing everywhere? It's, it's heavier than hell. The point is, is that they go through this activity and it doesn't say how long it takes, but can you imagine at some point, one of the guys going, can we just, can you just turn one of them into wine so we know why we're doing this? Can maybe we just do the well and just a little bit of wine spits out so we have a result? That's a great parable because of the ant. Wouldn't it be nice if the ant said, hey, I, like, show me the, pick, the, the puzzle on the box. I need to see what that looks like. And, and they don't. So we go back to the farmer, right? Same thing. It's not filling cisterns with water from an outside the city well, but it's all the work that he or she does before they ever see a little sprout. And they may not. What if the locusts come? What if this? What if that? What if this? All the crap they can't control, they don't pay attention to that. Not enough to keep them from farming. They may lay awake at night. I don't know. But they're, if, if, they're gonna, if, they, if you haven't see a farmer with a crop, think about how much work happened before they ever saw a result. I mean, it's literally about focusing on our activities. And once we, you really start to get this in, in your paradigm, and I mean this with all that I say, people start looking more and more like Donut Boy. We, when we look in the mirror, we speak it out like I did Bill to Bill, my buddy. We sound like Donut Boy. You start realizing like, I, hey, the wind's blowing really strong today. Okay. It's raining. Get an umbrella. Stay inside. I mean, deal. It's like, right? I, it, I call them basement. I mean, I don't know. It just seems, and I know it's not easy in the everyday walk. Like there are certain circumstances, certain days, certain moments where I'm not saying this is easy, but from a 10,000 foot view, I mean, I'd love for somebody to be, hey man, results are the most important thing. I'd be like, go read a book from any super athlete, super successful, anything. And they're going to tell you, matter of fact, Nick Saban, coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide, probably one of the greatest, he's still a coach, he's an active coach today. He tells his players, and he's one of the most successful coaches ever. So he has some credibility, you know, re results matter, right? That you can't fake them. So he tells his players during the game not to look at the scoreboard. He says, don't look at the scoreboard. You, it doesn't matter what the scoreboard says. What matters is every time, <coughs> excuse me, the ball is snapped, each individual has a particular job to do. All you have to focus on is you do your job to the best of your ability every play. He said, and I almost guarantee you look up the end of the end of the game and you're going to you're going to see a scoreboard where you're winning. And he is right, because you look at the end of most Alabama games and they've won. And a lot of times by a lot, um, I think they've three or four national championships in the last five or six years. I mean, just an amazing program. And he tells his players not to look at the scoreboard. Every golfer that I've ever read upon that I've ever watched does not play the person they're golfing with. They don't play, you talk to the good ones, they don't play each other, they play themselves. Or they'll tell you they're playing the course. It's me against the course, it's me against me. I mean, how many athletes, I started really, really succeeding when I stopped worried about what the person running in the lane next to me was doing, when I just worried about what I needed to worry about. Focus on our activity. If we know that reading is good for us, read five minutes a day, break it down into little things. In AA, they'll tell you, Hey, sometimes you got to live one day at a time. You can't look to the next day. And I would tell you, because 25 years ago, I was there. Sometimes you got to live one minute at a moment. Like I've served this minute. Now I've, sp I've served this minute. I mean, it's, that's everything starts in our mind and everything starts with one small step. And I love some of these and we're running up on it. Hold on. 
Wanting it now keeps us from having it. Wanting it now keeps us from having it. Wanting it all keeps us having nothing. Wanting it all keeps us having nothing. I have said before, and I've had people even say, oh, you maybe shouldn't say that. You might, you know, not, you might not attract people. And I'd be like, I, I say it because I don't want to attract certain people. It's, it's true. And I'm not saying I, I'm repelling certain people. I just know that, first of all, we're transparent. We are who we are. This is what it is. We don't make it up to be something that's not. And it's not a get rich quick program. We, have we had reps come in with big followings and make, you know, a couple hundred grand first year? Absolutely. No question. But it's not set up like that. It's set up to be run like an ant. We talk about that all the time. He says, Oh man, I love it. I wish, golly, I, I probably should have taken some notes on this one, Leandro, because there's some really good stuff in here. Um, That's a recap from this. But he, yeah, maybe we'll recap. But he did say this. He said, I wrote, he said, closely related to I want it all is I want it now. And my first book, Changes That Heal, that's his first book named Changes That Heal. I wrote that the shortcut is always the longest path. This guy and I are brothers in another life, man. I mean, how many times have you said that the longest, longest uh, trip to you and our, or we and our dreams or goals is a shortcut, man. And this, so he says, yeah, right here, wanting it all keeps us from, keeps us from having any wanting it now keeps you from having it. And here, what are your ant farms? Life, I'm just going to, this is just some of the practical stuff. Life is what happens to us while we are making other plans, but too often we get overwhelmed like Jessica, the uh, weight lady. She's the lady who want to lose weight. When the obstacles we see standing between us and our goals loom too enormous to tackle. I have never succeeded before. And, and these are some of the things that we would tell ourselves that would keep us from moving forward. I've never succeeded before in spite of my many attempts. You know what? You just had failed enough. I told my uh, chiropractor today that I, I talked about, I think it was on Monday, that people have a misconception of entrepreneurs. I'm not kidding you. It's amazing how many people think, oh, Entrepreneurs don't fail. That's why they succeed. The, nothing could be further from the truth. The reason we succeed is because we failed more than anybody else. I truly believe that. I mean, I even my chiropractor, she's starting an online, all natural health thing. And she's like, I don't know if it'll work. And I go, that's what makes you an entrepreneur. You don't know till you know, but you got to be willing to try. All right. So the distance from where I am now, where I want to be seems too great. Well, that goes back to last week. Remember the girl was the lady who was trying to become a lawyer. She's like, but it's going to take three years. That's too long. And the guy says, three years is coming. It, I mean, tomorrow's not promised, but three years is going to come. Do you want to have the same crummy life that you hate? Or do you want to take steps now, one day at a time, to where when three years does come, now you got a law degree. Now you're ready to go. The goal is too big. Break it up into small things. I need to lose 100 pounds. Well, you know what you got to do to lose first? The first pound. And he says that to her. He goes, nobody got to 30 pounds before losing pound number one. So do you understand? Now you start to see how fallous, how ridiculous the mindset is. Oh, I'm not going to do it. It's going to take me three years. All right, don't do it. I mean, why are you thinking about doing it? Right? I mean, and it goes back to the dog on the nail. Sometimes it just doesn't hurt enough yet. Things are too messed up to have any hope. The goal is just too big. I don't have the skills. I don't have the resources like money or help. I don't have the time to accomplish it. Sounds like Eeyore. <laughs> oh, that's just the way it happens. There are others perceived obstacles. There are other perceived obstacles to success as well. But when we analyze each of them, we can see that they can be overcome one brick at a time. But that is not all the good news of one brick at the time. The other aspect is that it does not just apply to specific tasks like losing weight or paying off a mortgage. It applies to virtual, virtually every human endeavor. I agree with that. Here are some examples of how you can change your life and succeed in areas you never thought possible. This is the practical part. All right, I'm just going to touch on a few of these. If your marriage is faltering, restore it one counseling session at a time, one act of kindness at a time, one, one example of not overreacting at a time, one box of chocolates or bouquet of flowers at a time, or one, you know, doing something unexpected or sacrificial at a time. If your relationship with your difficult teenager is strained, build it one moment of connection at a time. Don't expect instant maturity and give up because three hours later, he seems impossible again. Boy, I wouldn't say my relationship with James is strained, 
but I'm being driven crazy. And that meant a lot to me, one connection point at a time. And I am that way. Sometimes I expect uh, results faster than they need to come. Mm-hmm. And certainly with kids and, and relationships, that would be a bad thing because who's setting the time? Again, it's, it's a delusional construct. Well, it would only be fair if he straightened up in a week. It's like, that. where are you, where are you getting that from? If you're in sales, build a portfolio of clients one call at a time. Do not expect instant success. Meet with one prospect at a time. Sell one policy or widget at a time. If you want to start a new company or grow the one that you have, get one more customer at a time. This really applies to me because we're thinking of some new business ventures. And I'm thinking, Leandro, I promise you, I promise every one of you, I literally thought, man, that's going to take a while to build. And I'm reading this and I'm like, man, okay, I'm a firm. Uh, That time's coming, whether I got a new business going or not. If you're out of shape, exercise, as we have said, for 10 minutes a day for one week, then go 15 and then up from there. If you're single, if you're dating, if you're anxious and fearful about something, take one little step forward at a time. If you're shy and afraid of meeting too many people, but dissatisfied with the limited social life you have, take one little step of going to a function and saying hello to one person. I mean, when you break it down like that, all of a sudden it's like, I can do that, right? If you wanted a social gathering in your house, I mean, it just save money just a little over time. Forget about the balance that will that will compound over time. and You'll be amazed. Don't even look at it. Just make little deposits. I can list a million more examples, but I'm sure you get the idea. And as time goes on, you just like deja, my deja vu friends will succeed and others will look at you and say, I can't imagine how he or she did that. What an accomplishment. You can just look at the ant and say, thanks. The reality is for every overnight success we see, there are 10,000, at least 10,000 hours of practice that no one saw. You hear it all the time. I heard of, uh, I forget the name of it. It was a band I'd never heard of, Leandro, but uh, it was a national radio show. And the guy goes, man, y'all just kind of came out of nowhere. And the guy's like, no, we didn't. He said, we've been playing for 10 years now. And we now, it's like, it's, it's boom. Like now they're, they're top of the world. But nobody saw the, the dirty, dusty bars they were in. And, the, you know, nobody saw. He said they talked about one gig. One of the first ones they did, like six people were there. And four of them were the girlfriends of the band. And they were being hit on by the only two dudes who were there. <laughs> it was a good story. The point is, our perception of what success is, is never really what it is, unless it's the perception of our own. And even that can become skewed. Because when we started, we were just through the roof. COVID hit, we did now. And now we're doing this. And it's like, I, you know, now it's like, okay. I know next year's coming. I don't want to be here. And I damn sure don't want to be here. I want to be, well, maybe it's, you know, yeah, that's what we did in the beginning, but that maligned my expectations, right? Because now I acknowledge my faulty thinking in this business concept due to a, a, a get rich close, um, slow paradigm. Because even though we built this as a get rich slow, the business just took off very, very fast. But that kind of success can skew our expectations, right? It did mine and thank God I'm reading so I can go, wait a minute, just because it's not going to render a ton of revenue right off the bat is not a reason to abandon it. There may be other valid reasons, but that's not one of them, right? If I think it's going to work over time, then that should work for me based on being a deja vu person. And I haven't read anything in this book that I disagree with yet. I really, I really haven't. And I'm not saying I won't. I typically always do. I'm kind of surprised, um, you know, other than some little dinky stuff, it doesn't matter. All right. Wow, that was a lot. We are two minutes off. I, it feels like five minutes to me, I swear, when I, when I get into these rants. Um, any questions, any comments, yes. errors, additions, um, admissions, cares, concerns? Through, through Bob, it is a mistake to rely on anyone else to fulfill you or make you happy. I rely on God for my ultimate fulfillment and happiness, and that served me well in all areas of my life. My husband and my relationships are great because we take care of each other's responsibilities for our own happiness. And the biggest part of that role is the faith in God. Amen. Yes. But we also know we need people to get where we want to go. Yes. And we want to serve people. And you're right. The person is not what gives us the fulfillment, the loving them and serving them mm-hmm. and caring for them. That does fulfill us. Mm-hmm. Totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. But how they receive that. Like, what if you're like, oh, I made you this beautiful. And it happens all the time. What's the definition of giving? The true definition of giving, at least as I was told, was the, the uh, art of giving without expectation of return. 
But how many times do we make something for someone and go out of our way and they go, all right. And then, well, they didn't say thank you. No. Yeah. I want my donut. <laughs> <laughs> I made them this great meal and they didn't thank me. Well, if that's the way, reason you made it, maybe you shouldn't have made it. This you know, is, honestly, I mean, come directly from the heart. We, like, you know, the, the giving truly, I love to give. Uh, it makes me feel good. And a lot of times I'm giving to, to pastors or Nicaragua. I don't see, I don't get any reaction. Matter of fact, and I'll tell you guys this for a reason. I, I, I always, 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 when I give, I, I always do it anonymously. And I just gave some money to uh, the pastor of Nicaragua to build a house. And this has been a vision for many years. And, and in fact, we talked about the vision two years ago when I was down there and I'm, you know, we're, we're all talking about it and he's got all these followers and they're all helping build, right. And his, his students, and it's amazing. The students are both from kids to, to, you know, people a lot older than me. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't want the people to think that Matthew came in and gave him money. I want them to know that the, the real reason I gave it is because I wanted to, that it was my choice. Alberto didn't ask. I gave it to him. I don't want them to think that it's about me because the only reason I really wanted to give it to him is because of, of it was about him, right? So that really is the gift of giving. I, I didn't see Alberto's response. I told him I was going to do it over the phone and none of my friends down there know it was me and that's by design. So I'll never get that reception and I don't need it. That's not to say that I haven't been upset with how people have reacted to me serving them before. I'm not saying I've got it mastered. I'm just saying that's a good example of where I got it right. And I'm, I'm very appreciative for that because that's, a, that's not a human spirit thing, right? The human spirit is to hold grudges, hold bitterness, have high expectations on how people are going to react. And the only thing we really can't control is the third one. Can't manage how people are going to react. We can manage ourselves. And uh, so anyway, thank you for that comment. That's, that's fantastic. We do need to be fulfilled by other things. I think exercise is one of them. I think reading is one of them. I think self-development is one of them. I think meditation is one of them. I think great relationships certainly are a part of a fulfilling life, right? A good, you know, anyway. All right, anything else? We are right up on it. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Man, an hour is a long time. I appreciate you guys uh, taking time out of your day to, to attend this with me. I hope this is rewarding for you. It certainly has been me. Um, we're getting pretty close, Leandro. We're over halfway done. I know that. The next one is hate well. Hate well. And this, the guy, who, the guy who gave me this book, it was, he said it was his favorite chapter. Really? Yeah. It may not be mine, but I'm curious to see why it was his. Well, C.S. Lewis gave us the chapter. <laughs> Enough said. I don't even need to read it. I know I like it. <laughs> All right. You guys have a great day. Thank you very much. Hey, Monday, get as many people as you can on Monday. I, I'm, I'm really getting, I'm passionate about growing that because the people that are on that, um, you know, do a lot better. And I know there's a lot of people out there. So along the way, if anybody's asking questions or seems a little bit lost, tell them Monday's a good place to be. Yeah. All right, you guys have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.